So misinformation, something I've been interested in for a long time, and I got more interested in the psychology of misinformation back in October um, when I was taking a, an online professional development class um, called Information Literacy in Politically Polarized Times. Um, which was a really interesting class. And one of the things that we dug into was sort of looking at some of these sort of psychological factors behind misinformation. Um, so I used some of that actually in teaching um, an instruction session this past semester. So I've adapted some of those slides and then added more for us today. Um, and we are just going to jump in and we're gonna see how this goes. So let me pull up the actual slides, which I thought I had up, but I think I have too many windows up. How's everyone doing today while I while I figure out my my situation here? How's everyone? Thank you, Jenny, for, for doing that because it makes me feel like um, the imperfection of me, I'm not the only one. No, you're certainly. Certainly not. So thank you. Fun. I bet you did that on purpose. I know? did. I did. Sarah actually knew you needed that today. So thank I you said so to much. Here we go. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I think everyone here has been to a ULVLC session before, but just in case. Um, if you have not, or if you haven't in a while, please do feel free to use the Zoom chat. If you have questions or comments or anything while I'm going through, I will keep an eye on that. But let me go ahead and share my screen here. And let me pull the chat up over on this other side so I can see it. Okay, so here we are. Psychology of Misinformation 101 ULVLC session today, the last day of November believe it or not, in 2021. So the psychology of information more generally, um, the way it's set up is that we want to believe stuff. That's how our brains work. That's what they're into. Um, so when I have kind of pulled together some research and some ideas and concepts today um, that help us get to an answer of this question of why we're vulnerable, because we're very vulnerable to misinformation and to disinformation. Um, and if you haven't been to any of the sessions where I've kind of made the distinction between those, like the deep fake session that I did, misinformation is it can potentially be um, unintentional. Disinformation is intentional. It's meant to uh, potentially cause harm. Um, it's definitely meant to change people's minds or change the way that people think about things. We, we hear these terms used really interchangeably. I don't think they're interchangeable because I think disinformation, again, there's, a, there's an intent behind it. Um, but I do think it is um, the, the vulnerabilities, these psychological vulnerabilities are similar for both of them. Um, so in that way, I think we can talk about misinformation and disinformation together. But basically, the way brains work, human brains, I don't know much about other kinds of brains, but human brains, uh, they just basically want to do the least amount of work possible in any given situation. And this is, you know, we can look through sort of evolutionary history. Um, we can look through, uh, you know, the way that our attention spans and the way we use our attention has changed. But ultimately, at the, yes, basically, as Sean said, our brains want to be lazy. They want to be lazy. Um, and it's not necessarily out of any kind of, I don't know, you know, lazy has a pretty negative connotation, of course. Um, but really, our, our brains are trying to save time and effort um, for the things that we need We need our brains to do to really spend more time on. But this puts us in a vulnerable situation. So these are some of the concepts I'm going to talk a little bit about today. I will have these slides available. So if there's stuff that you're interested in here, you'll be able to see my references. I do feel like I should say right now at this point that like I did take a lot of psychology classes like 20 years ago in college, um, but I am not a psychologist. Um, I have learned all of this again through the course that I mentioned and through sort of my own research and trying to understand some of these concepts. And these are just selected concepts that I think are particularly interested, interesting related to the way we deal with information, particularly mis or disinformation. And they are cognitive miserliness. I just love, I love the idea of a cognitive miser. I'll talk more about that. 
system one and system two thinking, heuristics, confirmation bias, this is one we hear about a lot, identity protective cognition, motivated reasoning, and naive realism. So we're going to go through all of these and talk a little bit about the implications of them. So cognitive miserliness um, is uh, was really a term that was coined in the early 90s. I think the book was from 1991 that these two psychologists wrote, Susan Fisk and Shelley Taylor. Um, they wrote a book called Social Cognition. And in that book, they define the term cognitive miser. And from the APA's um, dictionary, or I guess they're, yeah, it's their psychological dictionary, they uh, define co a cognitive miser as anyone who seeks out quick, adequate solutions to problems rather than slow, careful ones. Despite this negative denotation, the term describes a general tendency among all people. That is, as a rule, people tend to use mental shortcuts in making judgments and drawing inferences. So again, just wanna like pull this out here. This is not that there are some people who are cognitive misers and there are some who aren't. This is a like, this is our sort of natural inclination. Um, and it's part again of that, the way that our brain wants to uh, look for a quick fix or a quick solution um, rather than spending the time and effort to, uh, you know, sort of problem or puzzle out a slow or careful solution to a problem. So this is one concept. Connected to that is this idea of system one and system two thinking. And I have actually seen this um, applied in a lot of different contexts. Um, so this is a psychological uh, concept that um, sometimes is talked about as dual process theory, um, which pos posits that there are sort of two different ways of thinking or two different ways of coming to a thought. And this is often um, presented in, in binaries. Um, so there's automatic or there's conscious. There's implicit or explicit, fast thinking or slow thinking, system one thinking or system two thinking. Um, and these are all kind of this, the same idea, just expressed in different ways. And so we've probably heard or seen or read um, these kinds of distinctions being made. Um, I, I see it a lot actually in um, EDI literature about unconscious bias, um, because a lot of our unconscious biases come from the things that are in that left column, our automatic, our implicit, our fast, our system one thinking. Um, but the same can be said of um, our sort of, again, vulnerability to misinformation. Uh, we want to be able to make these quick, automatic, uh, fast, you know, system one um, sort of distinctions or uh, decisions about the, the information that we're taking in. So Daniel Kahneman, who uh, had a book that came out, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was in 2011, and it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and he, in this book, there's an excerpt available for free on Scientific American, um, where he defines these two things and he sort of connects it back to a few specific psychologists' work before him. But he says that system one operates automatically and quickly with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. So these are the kind of things that are just happening kind of naturally in our mind, not only the sort of completely automatic things, but things like if I asked you um, what's two plus two, you'd be able to quickly say four. I hope most of us would. I mean, I'm not good at math, but I can do that one. Um, so some of the kind of things that we have just kind of worn into the grooves of our mind, basic math, um, being able to complete like common phrases, things like that. Again, it can become problematic because system one is also the sort of system where our um, stereotypes and implicit and unconscious biases live. Um, but they're also where a lot of uh, just our automatic behaviors and um, thought processes that we rely on to get through the day are. Whereas system two allocates attention to the effortful mental activities that demand it, including complex computations. Um, and these operations are often associated with the subjective experience of agency, choice, and concentration. So system two is where we actively, purposefully engage our brain. We say, all right, I need to think about this. I need to analyze this. I need to really um, spin, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using my, like they say here, agency, or I'm choosing to concentrate on this particular problem or activity. So the next concept is heuristics. Um, and heuristics, uh, a, lo a lot of the 
definitions that you'll see here are from a particular series of articles um, from First Draft News. Uh, they had a series on the psychology of misinformation that's very interesting. Uh, and they also did a webinar that they have available on their website where they talked to some uh, misinformation researchers sort of about what's going on in the misinformation world. So again, if you're really into it, I can give you lots of resources that can help you learn more. Um, but heuristics are indicators we use to make quick judgments. We use heuristics because it's easier than conducting complex analysis, especially on the internet where there's a lot of information. The problem with heuristics is that they often lead to incorrect conclusions. So heuristics are those sort of short mental shortcuts that we rely on when we are like evaluating information. And in this article, The Psychology of Information, Why We're Vulnerable, there is a quote from Claire Wardle, who is a digital literacy expert. Um, and one of the things she talks about is, especially for those of us who uh, were around before the internet or in the early days of the internet, our heuristics about evaluating information are a little bit different. And some of that is because we developed some of these heuristics in more of a print world. So for example, um, when I see a journal article online, which I see all the time, you know, in my own research, helping students, all that kind of stuff. When I see a journal article, I know what it is, but in my mind, I can kind of go back to when I saw a journal article for the first time, which was in print in an issue that was bound in a bound journal that was on the stacks on the shelf. And so some of my heuristics about journal articles and what they are and how they work come from that mind frame. Whereas my current students um, have really probably only ever seen journal articles online, and that actually makes them more difficult to identify and understand. Um, so, for example, um, when I see when I help students um, like cite journal articles, one of the things I started to notice is that there's so much information on the page. Um, for example, if you're looking at, I know we've got some tech services folks and other folks in here, let's say we're looking at an article that we get from Taylor and Francis. So frequently I have students um, try to cite Taylor and Francis as authors because they're just seeing so much stuff on the page and they don't have any heuristics that they can rely on necessarily to say, oh, but Taylor and Francis is the publisher, which we don't even really need to know for a journal article citation. And then this piece of information is the title of the journal. This piece is the title of an article, et cetera, et cetera. So we um, bring in our own heuristics from sort of other experiences of information that we've had. Same thing might be um, applicable to, let's say, a newspaper, right? So if you grew up reading or seeing um, print newspapers, um, then you have a specific heuristic about the way newspapers are organized and the fact that, let's say, the opinions or the op-eds are sort of one, um, you know, one specific section. So if you're looking at it in, in print, you're seeing, okay, this is an opinion piece, it's in the opinion section, but when we come across these things and they're individual or they're not part of that sort of system that we have come in, come to understand, then it is more complicated. So heuristics, again, indicators, shortcuts that we use in our mind, um, and, and this connects way back to um, system one thinking, because again, we're trying to do the easy part. We're trying to say like, oh, okay, I think this looks credible because it has X, Y, and Z when we're looking at information, or this seems reliable because this is the author or because it's from this source, the kind of heuristics that we've developed and that we rely on a lot. And Jenny, can I ask, does this have like relevance, it seems like to like stereotypes where we take shortcuts to judge things in a sense that we may not be right, but we look at something as a, oh, it's the X, therefore it's gotta be Y without even really questioning whether there is a correlation or not, but shortcutting our brain and the brain to shortcut and stereotypes. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a lot of connection. And I think heuristics, again, in this, in the way that it's being defined here, definitely um, connects to that because, again, it's shortcuts. And, and we use shortcuts because we have to, right? We can't um, engage system two thinking about everything all the time. We would have constant decision fatigue. We wouldn't be able to do anything. We wouldn't be able to get anything done. Um, so definitely stereotypes fall in this where we have 
built either ourselves from our own personal experience or even more likely just from sort of, uh, you know, the society that we grow up in and the stereotypes that we build and develop there. They really wear these kind of grooves into our brain. Um, again, I'm not a brain scientist, so I don't know if they're real grooves or just like, you know, metaphorical grooves, but they're there. Um, and that's, you know, it's something that's why it's hard to overcome stereotypes because we have to be able to engage beyond those sort of quick judgments or those quick indicators. We have to engage that system to thinking to be able to say, okay, wait a minute, why am I making this assumption? Confirmation bias. You've heard of it. We've all heard of it. It's real. Um, it's the tendency to believe information that confirms your existing beliefs and to reject information that contradicts them. Disinformation actors can exploit this tendency to amplify existing beliefs. And we see this all the time in disinformation campaigns. Um, so if we, we have disinformation, uh, there's been a lot of disinformation, for example, about the COVID vaccine. And some of it relies on this concept of confirmation bias that it draws on, um, you know, beliefs or values or things that people sort of hold dear to them, things that are important to us about our identities or who we are or what we think and do and believe in. Um, they can really heavily be exploited. Uh, confirmation bias is like the main cognitive bias I hear talked about sort of in general conversation in the news and, you know, in conversations about misinformation. Um, but there are actually hundreds of cognitive biases. This is just one of them. Um, and it's, I think, the one that's probably most connected to misinformation. Um, so that's why I wanted to make sure to bring it up. And I also like to talk about confirmation bias and I talk about it with students a lot. Um, because I think we need to kind of name it and, and just sort of acknowledge that it's there, that it exists, that it's part of our sort of human experience, um, because I think ignoring it just makes it worse. Um, and when we ignore it, we might be thinking, oh, I don't, I don't have that. I don't have confirmation bias. I'm like, I'm good. I know I'm, I don't, you know, get taken in by things that are, are meant to take me in. Right, so if we're able to acknowledge these kind of things, uh, we are able to engage with them more effectively. Okay, I identity protective cognition is pretty similar, but it, Swan, Troy Swanson, who's a librarian, goes into a little more depth um, in an article I have cited here. So. Identity protective cognition is the tendency for individuals to preference information that connects in some way with who they believe themselves to be. So this, again, is very similar to what we just talked about with cognitive bias, but Swanson goes on to explain the part of our um, part of why we can get into like he's like he says here. This is why there are heated arguments about climate change, but not about gravity. Topics related to politics, religion, and race, among many topics, are charged beyond simple fact-based analyses. Um, so these are again the things that we that we bring, uh, or that we connect to our identities. So if it is something um, like gravity, for example, it's probably not something that we get too heated up about because that's one of the maybe maybe in this world one of the few things that we might all agree on because we we see evidence of it it's it's a concept that's been around a long time whereas with climate change um that has a lot to do with people's beliefs and and values and um you know understanding of science and things like that and so it can become really heated because i'll give an example i have a family member for who is not convinced about climate change being a real thing. So when we talk about it, it's really hard. Uh, it's really hard to have this conversation because it's, it's part of my identity that I believe the scientific evidence of climate change, it's real. Um, and it is part of this person's identity that they think it's maybe somewhat of a hoax, right? So what, what we see when we're having these kind of conversations is not um, I want to engage with you about something you think or believe in. It's I'm attacking some sort of piece of your identity or who you are. Uh, and that is obviously something that's challenging. And Anne brings up in the chat, greed. 
um, that, yes, I imagine that ties to many of these. Motivated reasoning, another uh, idea that's connected to the two that we just talked about, really. When people use their reasoning skills to believe what they want to believe rather than determine the truth. The crucial point here is the idea that people's rational faculties rather than lazy or irrational thinking can cause misinformed belief. And so the the one of the potential differences between motivated reasoning and something like confirmation bias or identity protective cognition is that we fall into this um, sort of, uh, we, we go down this path of saying, oh, this isn't just something that I believe because, uh, or something that I am being, think strongly about or feel strongly about because I believe in it. Here are my rational reasons. Here's my reasoning, my logical stuff uh, sort of beyond, yeah, I did my own research kind of thing. And so we've seen a lot of the danger of, of motivated reasoning because you can find facts or information to support anything, especially now with the amount of information that's available. But with motivated reasoning, um, we, we sort of feel when we're engaging in motivated reasoning like, like we're not experiencing confirmation bias or identity productive cognition because what we're really doing is like all based in fact and logic and truth and things like that. Um, some psychologists kind of reject this idea. I wanted to make a note there that they don't think that motivated reasoning is really an issue for us in terms of vulnerability to misinformation. Um, but it is a sort of topic of conversation that is being argued in um, cognitive psychology. Naive realism, according to Lillian Field et al., uh, it is a tendency to, see, to believe the world is exactly as we see it, seeing is believing. Most of us are assuming, or most of us assume that our raw perceptions are accurate and unbiased reflections of the world, uncontaminated by our preferences, preconceptions, and interpretations. Um, so you can see some of the sources that have been cited within this Lillian Field article. I mean, we have a, a citation back to 1966. So this is something psychologists have been talking about for a long time. And it makes sense when you when you think about this, like the way it's sort of my natural inclination to believe that the world is the way I experience it. And again, this all it all comes back together to lots of um, problematic things that we might think about, like the way I experience the world as a you know white educated disabled woman is going to be very different than the way someone of different identity uh, experiences the world, but it's our natural sort of naive, as they say, um, assumption is like, oh, the world is as I see it right now. This is how it exists for everyone. Um, and so that's a, all of it connects back to that idea of system one thinking or cognitive miserliness, this idea that like, we're not trying to constantly be activating that higher level thinking in our brains all the time. So we're going to do a little, we're going to do a little activity. And this is an adaptation of an activity that I did with a class. Um, and it's going to work a little bit differently. So let me grab the, let me just copy this link and put it in the chat. And so I'll have, if you're able to, um, I will ask everyone to head over to that page, which is a Google Doc. And I'll just kind of show you what I want you to do here. We're just experimenting. So this has a link to an article about avocados. Um, you don't have to read the whole article, but I will ask you if possible to just kind of skim it a bit. And then this is, um, and you know what, I'll just go ahead and pop the direct link to that article in the chat too, in case it's easier for you to get to there since there are so many of us on this, on this page. But after you have skimmed through, I have um, some questions here and I'm gonna ask you to just grab a line underneath the question and put, you know, put some ideas in it. Um, and you can uh, like, well, I guess that's not a question, <laughs> that one there three questions, sorry, struggling today. Um, 
just feel free to respond any way you want to. And if you have the same thing to say that someone else said, that's fine. You can say it too, or you can say plus one in a comment or whatever. This is just an experiment. I just want to see how it goes. Um, the, when I did this with a class, I had individual documents for each student and I, I didn't think that was going to be the most appropriate or efficient, effective way for us to do this today. Um, so I'm going to give you about five minutes to skim through this article, to add any thoughts you have under the sort of questions um, that I have listed here, and then we will talk about it a little bit. And I'm going to pause the screen recording or pause the recording while that happens because it'll just be dead air because I'm going to mute myself. Okay, I have unpaused the recording. So we are recording again. Um, and I am going to head back to my screen sharing. Here we go. Okay. Like I said, I love the work that y'all did here. Um, so I asked you a couple of questions. I appreciate someone bolding them. That was helpful. I should have done that. Um, based on what you saw when you skimmed through the article, what was your immediate instinct about its credibility? So I saw a lot of things like, mm, it does not look super credible. It looks like clickbait. They just do a bunch of links to their own website. Um, yeah, just sort of uh, like I see this fluff piece. Several people mentioned um, that uh, the article does uh, happen to say that this study, this is a real study that they're talking about, um, but they they did, they do say that actually this was uh, funded by the Haas Avocado Board, um, which as we might assume, right, that um, they have a particular stake in how people feel about avocados, specifically Haas Avocados. Um, so someone has a pre-library background in clinical trial design, so totally fixated on what's not said. So this is one of the things too, when we see um, like popular source, popular sources like this, websites, newspapers, magazines reporting on scholarly research, um, we see a really wide variety of quality of that reporting, right? And so this is, I would hope that if I were to see something reported about this in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or, or, you know, sort of a more major publication that it would do a better job of at least explaining um, some about the trial design and who the participants were and things like that. Um, but this is a big issue that we have, um, and it's problematic when we think about information access, um, because we as um, <laughs> cherry picking results is a huge thing. Yes, believe it or not, it's a huge thing in student research papers too. Um, and probably also library worker research papers, if my own experiences uh, can be extrapolated from. But we, we get like, so we as people who are affiliated with UNCG, definitely would have access to this study. I don't remember if this is an open access um, article or not the original study itself. But many people don't have that kind of access right so they rely on these popular press reportings of things and that's something this I won't, that's not really what i'm talking about today but i wanted to mention it because it's a way that that we can potentially spread misinformation in the sense that it's not the whole picture and sean mentions in the chat 105 adults is not um, a large sample size um but when we see things like we when we see uh, headlines, especially, they're not going to say study of 105 adults shows that avocados may or may not make a difference in your weight loss, right? They're going to have a sort of pithier and more appealing clickbaity kind of headline. Um, so this is one of the things that we see when we see things misreported or not fully reported. Um, in the news, especially in terms of scientific or sort of technological advances or things like that. Um, yeah, the results only talk about female participants. Um, yeah, so there's 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 a lot to question here. Um, it's not. I wouldn't say that this source itself is mis or disinformation, um, because again, it 
I don't see things in here that are inaccurate related to the original study from the Journal of Nutrition, um, but it's again very it's very specifically targeted to the audience of this website. Eat this, not that. Um, I asked you this one. Do you have any particularly strong feelings about avocados and what could, kind of impact could that have? Um, people love avocados. Oh no, before you lost your gallbladder. Oh no, I hate that. Um, the topic of avocados <laughs> is triggering sometimes because of that whole millennial versus boomer struggle. Oh, that's funny. I think avocado farming is bad for the environment. So we do have feelings about avocados, but they're probably not identity protective cognition level feelings. Um, so, you know, where I would think this would become something that would be really problematic or challenging in terms of a confirmation bias or identity protective cognition situation would be if you're like, my whole family, I come from a long line of avocado farmers and this is how we have, you know, made all of our, um, you know, all of our money. And um, so we have this personal financial and livelihood stake in it. That's gonna make a much bigger difference than, yeah, avocados are like pretty good. Um, the This one probably is the closest, avocado farming is bad for the environment. That's probably gonna be closest to that um, to something that might trigger confirmation bias or something related to uh, that identity protective cognition, because this is again something that you believe or it's related to a value that you have. So then I wanted to talk about um, heuristics. Um, so again, those are indicators we use to make quick judgments. And so we can see some sort of visual heuristics, I think, on this page. Um, like there is they what one of the ones that they rely heavily on are like um, sort of icons, healthy eating, evidence-based, fact-checked by Cheyenne Buckingham. Um, they have these sort of visual indicators um, and they also talk a bit, as I go through, I think they try to also, for example, they talk to someone with a master's of science who's a registered dietitian um, and health coach. Uh, and then they, they talk about a variety of other things, but they, they bring in information from the study and then they talk to relevant experts. And that's one way that uh, news sources or popular sources do try to sort of build their credibility with you as a reader is to say, oh, look, we talked to someone who's an expert in food and here's what they had to say. Um, <laughs> so I loved this one when I saw it. The avocados in the picture look fake slash gross. These are how our brains work. Um, and this is one of the reasons I'm so happy that y'all were willing to answer this question. Um, there's a stereotype, I think, that avocados are healthy, hence automatically want to believe they can't do any wrong. Yeah, avocados, there's this big explosion of avocados as, as healthy fats. Uh, maybe 15 years ago is when I first heard, feel like I heard people talking about this a lot. Um, let's see. Opening the article talking about weight loss automatically garnered an eye roll. Yeah, thinking about like the way that it's targeted again. So for, for us, um, who or for the person who's who's saying that um that experience was like, oh, this is just going to be some dumb weight loss article. But for other people, that might be in their mind, they might say, oh no, this is good. This is what I was looking for, right? So a heuristic, like many of these other things is very personal to us. I see things um, like the, someone mentioned the About Us page and that's where people are trying to sell diet books. So these are some of the kind of things that we look for. And I really, again, appreciate y'all sharing here um, because it lets me get a sense um, and lets us get a sense of each other sort of, um, frameworks and sort of mindsets and what we're what we're thinking about when we're going into a source like this. So love it. Thank you. You're the best. Okay. So a question here, would it make a difference if you were looking at an article that wasn't about avocados? And I'm going to give you an example, give you some headline examples here that might that might spark feelings about different things. And these are the same headlines I used when I did this with a class. So the first one is very much for college students. 
So headline, study finds college men are lazy and shiftless compared to college women, right? So thinking about your identity, if you're a college man, you might be like, this is messed up. And if you're a college woman, you might be like, yes, this is my experience of the world. Um, <laughs> Rachel says men are the worst. Um, yeah, so, so for my students in the class I was working with, um who are college students this was something where i did i even saw people like rolling their eyes at this uh study finds sociopaths less likely to wear masks this is very targeted this was from earlier in the pandemic i think it was from january um if you're a person who has made the choice not to wear a mask you might look at this and say like i'm not a sociopath this is messed up and if you're a person who is mad that people aren't wearing masks, you might look at this and be like, yes, this is exactly, I knew it. I knew there was something wrong, right? Why women, including feminists, are still attracted to benevolently sexist men. Um, you know, so if you are someone who identifies as a feminist and you see something like this, again, you're gonna potentially bristle. You're gonna have a feeling. Uh, why, why white people downplay their individual racial privileges. Same thing, if you're a white person, if that's part of your identity, um, you are potentially going to have a, a feeling about this. Your feeling might be like, yes, this is true. This is my experience. Or it might be like, no, but I'm a good white person and I do my best with this. And so you might sort of have some um, emotional kind of response here. And then finally, this one's for me and Sarah and Anna and anyone else here who is a vegetarian. Um, I, saw, <laughs> I saw this headline, I'm a vegetarian. It's an important part of who I am. Um, vegetarians have healthier biomarkers than meat eaters. I don't know what biomarkers are. I don't know what they're talking about, but I saw this headline and I was like, of course, we're great people. Uh, I'm probably gonna live forever. You know, those are some of my things. So when we look at stuff like this, um, we have these immediate emotional responses and that's part of our system one thinking. Um, it's, it's confirmation bias, right? I might look at this and say like, oh, I'm ready to share. Like, I don't even care. Again, like I said, I literally don't know what biomarkers are. I could make a guess. Um, but just seeing a headline like this that um, makes me feel like my choices are being validated in some way by research it's something that really draws on our confirmation bias, like Tiffany says in the chat. And this is, again, this confirmation bias in particular is one of those things that's very easily exploited. Thank you, Sean. A biomarker is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indi indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological processes to a therapeutic intervention still would have to break that down a little bit to be able to explain what that means in my own words, but I appreciate your research skills. So thinking a little bit about strategies that you can use. One is to be aware of your own biases, like, like you all are. I mean, we talked about this. That's part of why I created that activity. The original activity was longer um, and went into some more questions that were again, they were, those were done individually. So people weren't sort of exposing themselves to the rest of their classmates thinking about some of these things, but to get in the habit of being aware of your own biases, knowing that you have them, um, you know, knowing that they're there. Uh, when we talk about source evaluation with students, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about bias and often students tell us that bias is one of the things that they look for in a source when they're trying to evaluate it. Um, and I think one thing that we can do as educators, as library workers, is to also encourage our, our students, our learners, our colleagues, our family members to not only think about bias they might see inherent in a source, but think about the bias that we bring to sources ourselves when we're using them. Practice healthy skepticism. I say healthy there because I'm not talking about deep cynicism, like we can't trust information anymore. Um, that's not helpful. Um, so practicing a healthy level of skepticism. And like several people said when looking at the avocado article, if it sounds too good to be true, like it's probably too good to be true. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to, you know, kind of test that theory out a little bit. Be aware of the effects of misinformation. Um, and I could do a whole separate session on that. And maybe I will if people are interested in it. And then practicing analytic or system two thinking. So I'm going to go into this a little bit more. 
be aware of your own biases. So this is from the News Literacy Project, um, and they say the first step is count. To, first step in countering confirmation bias is to recognize it in ourselves. Um, that's not the end of it. You can't just say like, "Yes, I am confirmation biased." And I will now read this article, right? You need to make sure that you are aware of it and that you, they suggest in the News Literacy Project, again, they're very news focused, um, that you look at a wider range of sources than you might initially um, be drawn to. So looking at different opinion pieces, they do make a point of saying credible sources. So they're not suggesting that you go, uh, you know, deep into a conspiracy web or something to, to just, just for the sake of hearing other opinions. Um, but they say, remember to gut check your own biases and seek out information from diverse sources, and then you can weigh in with confidence. Um, this is back to that Swanson article that I mentioned. Um, confirmation bias can be broken. It happens all the time. But the individual must have a disposition that is open to change. This disposition appears to require some level of reflection on one's own worldview. And reflection is the only way we can recognize the origins of our own beliefs and also how our beliefs stand relative to the beliefs of others. So again, system two thinking. Reflection is automatically going to be a system two level thought because reflection has to be something that we do intentionally. These aren't, reflection isn't happening like automatically in that system one sort of part of our brains. Um, but we do need to, you know, if we, if we want to really be truly aware of our biases um, and, and think about potentially sort of breaking them um, or sort of interrupting them, I think is probably a better way to say it. Um, we've got to be able to be reflective. Uh, healthy skepticism, again, emphasis on healthy. Uh, it's skepticism is an awareness of the potential for manipulation and a desire to accurately understand the truth, different from cynicism, which is generalized distrust. So there's been a huge, there's a lot of research done, especially um, I think some of the most um, effective and sort of accessible research that's been done on this is from the Pew Internet um, and Internet Research, I forget what they're called now, but Pew Research, you probably know them. Um, and the Knight Foundation um, have done all this research that is just sort of tracking the like increase, well, I guess I, should, I was going to say increased distrust, really decreased trust in um, the media, uh, in some of our sort of uh, major, our democratic system, things like that, these sort of big parts of what we are in the United States, particularly sort of as a society. And when we see that, trust dwindling or that distrust uh, kind of spiking it's it's concerning because we do we still need to that's when people turn to social media only to get information or word of mouth or um things that are shared uh just you know within their family or things like that being able to be health healthily skeptical of news sources or other sources that we come across there's a big difference between that and saying like i don't trust anything that comes out of the news or the media. Um, and that's also involves uh, emotional skepticism, which is when you're aware that someone could be, someone or something could be trying to manipulate you through those emotions. Oh, and it says here, I should have, I should have mentioned this. Um, it might involve taking a moment to calm down before sharing a shocking but false post. So one of the things I encourage students to do when I teach um, about this is to, when they see something, especially if they have a strong emotional response, I suggest they take three deep breaths before they do anything, um, including um, sharing it, even reading it, going beyond the headline, that kind of thing, as a way to just sort of like pause, take a second to fight that immediate response. Research has indicated that just like, just being aware that misinformation can have negative effects and can influence us, um, helps us fight the effects of it. So just knowing, oh, misinformation can have negative effects on me is something that can help you combat misinformation. And they talk in here about the continued influence effect. I knew I wouldn't have time to go into this today, but the continued influence effect is really interesting psychological concept. Um, 
that's why it's hard to to correct misinformation um, because we often uh, just remember the first thing that we heard about a topic and there's an interesting video that i can send y'all um if you're interested about uh the sort of enduring misinformation that's related to the uh like places on your tongue where you taste certain things um like you know you taste sour in one spot and salty in one spot or whatever um, that was kind of misreported initially um, to the extent that it's actually still taught even in and put in textbooks in a way that does not accurate to the original. And that's a great example of the continued influence effect. And then practicing analytic thinking, also known as deliberation, a system two thinking um, that involves thoughtful evaluation rather than quick intuitive judgments. Misinformation researchers found that analytic thinking helps to accurately discern the truth in the context of news headlines. This is true again related to deep fakes. If you were at my deep fake session, they found that people who had a higher level of cognitive or analytical engagement when they were considering deep fakes that they were shown, uh, were they were much more effective at being able to identify them than folks who were doing more of that system one thinking. So to sum it up, I encourage you to practice metacognition or thinking about your thinking. Slow down, be reflective. Um, if you have, like I said, if you have a really strong immediate response, especially if it's sort of something that relates to your identity or your values, definitely take a beat, take a breath, and then try to evaluate using some of the practices that we talked about here or some of the other practices you know that we all know about as sort of information professionals um, but do this especially if you're thinking about sharing it and that's it seven minutes does anyone have any questions for me oh and let me um let me give y'all the link to this. Oh, thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Thanks, Michelle. Y'all are so nice. This is great. I love it. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> oh. Rachel, you keep me humble. I um, can't I, wait. I can't wait for 102. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will see. So it does seem like there's interest in that. Um, oh, so yes. I will definitely. Yep. Um, so Sam, help me remember that for uh, for next semester. Um, this was great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I know that you're thinking about doing some of the student workshops. And I think this could be a really good um, also collaboration with uh, the counseling center, with the weather oh, well, that's interesting. how they do the art of seeing. And, you know, as you know, from the MAC working groups, they're really looking to like integrate co-curricular more, particularly in these high enrollment classes. So I think, again, there's a lot to be done, you know, for that, you know, I mean, I selfishly am thinking about health and wellness um competency you know because there's a lot of ways this could be a workshop like this could be done there as well so anyway i just wanted to throw that out there while i was thinking about it after watching this session yeah thank you that's really i, I didn't really make that connection but i think that's a great thought yes they, i think they would be excited to talk to you about that maybe i could get some real psychologists to be like you defined this wrong <laughs> we'll see all right, well, thanks so much, y'all. Thanks for participating. I really um, had fun um, talking to you about this and I would love to talk to you more. So please uh, let me know if you have questions. Um, and thank you all. The, pretty much everyone here has been like a long time VIP ULVLC uh, supporter. So thank you all so much for your support. And I hope everyone has a lovely day. Bye.